Tonight I'm going to go against the grain. I am going to talk about abiotic things. Rather than talking about the ecosystem, I'm going to focus attention on the basin itself, if you like, the cradle for the life that you tend to consider. Now, as most of us here have a very disparate background, uh, it's not working. Got it. <laughs> there we go. I'm going to, I have to give you a little bit of background just so that my talk has some credibility that you don't, you do believe what I'm saying. And I'm just going to go through this by, first of all, giving you a little bit of um, a feeling for the geological time scale. I'll then start just with a few comments on the catchment area and its impact on Sunflay on the basin. Um, then move focus down to the estuary itself and ultimately look at a little bit of what we've done in modifying the basin through time before summarizing it. So to start off with geological time, the oldest rocks on the planet we've come across are four and a half billion years old. And geolog geologists break the time scale down, first of all, into eons, into three major eons, which are based really on the evolution of life. These are in turn broken down into um, eras and periods and epochs. Um, but now the, the, in, the, in the southern peninsula here, we have no evidence for any of the geological events that took place in either the Archean or the Proterozoic. And it is only when we uh, come right up at the top into the, into the Phanerozoic that we find our first part of the history recorded, and that is with the intrusion of the Cape Granite about 450 million years ago. Now that, that rock type you can actually see down here, there's a couple of very big boulders of granite on Brin Road, just across the way here, and it is that rock type, the oldest one in the area, that at some depth underlies Sunflay. After the deposition, after the intrusion of the granite, a little bit later, we then had sediments belonging to the Cape Supergroup uh, deposited on top of them, and they are the rocks that form the the cliffs above us. These belong are sandstones belonging to the Peninsula Formation, and after their deposition and consolidation, they were then folded into the mountains, and we know we talk about the Cape Fold Belt or the being uh, across the valley there, and then yet again over to my, uh, after a, a long delay with a lot of erosion and uplift, uh, the, we ultimately got to the development of a series of faults. And I've just put one set here in, in here, which you, of a, a little fault system, which you can see. And these are really quite exciting to me, at least. And uh, that is these, these, ro these faults represent a period of crustal extension that ultimately led to the separation of South America from South Africa and the formation of the South Atlantic Ocean, ultimately the Benguela Current coming into it and that having a lot of an impact on the climate and our biosphere in this area. Um, <clears throat> so now what I want to do is to take you to what happened after this and focus in on that uh, that period there, and I'm taking a right a jump right across uh, to the epochs, the last 30 million years. In, the, in other words, here we're only looking um, at just the last, well, a really short period in the of the whole whole period itself. That represented about from there represented about just the remaining 13 percent of geological time in the Earth, and here we are down to something like looking at about six percent in this area here, divided into these epochs, the Oligocene, Miocene, Pliocene, Pleistocene, Holocene, and geologists now are just talking about introducing another epoch referred to as the Anthropocene, uh, which is an, 
a period where Homo sapiens had significantly altered the Earth's surface, the atmospheres, and the oceans. And there's evidence in the geological record of this, this impact we've had. What has been happening has been a long debate internationally as to where the Anthropocene should start. Some people have suggested that it should have started with the Industrial Revolution, where clearly we were impacting on the, on the planet already. But just in July this year, they've actually agreed, or they've recommended, I should say, the Working Committee has recommended to the international body that it should start at 1950, which to me is a little bit sad in the sense that the marker that, in, that coincides with 1950 is... Uh, a large number of thermonuclear detonations. So we're marking our presence on this on this on this uh, planet with some of our most destructive activities. It's quite intriguing, though, to me. If this does come into into uh, acceptance, it means that I would have been born in a different geological epoch to most of the younger people in this room. <laughs> uh, um, just to ten, take you back and to what does this mean for us, at about 30 million years, the peninsula mountains would have been separated from the mountains across the bay, but you would not really recognize what they look like in terms of their morphological shape. Um, and then the period called the Oligocene was a period of prolonged erosion. And during that time, a fairly narrow valley separating the two would have been opened up more and more, uh, tending towards what we now know as the Cape Flats, this big, flat, broad area in between. But by about the time of the middle of the Miocene, you would start to be able to recognize most of the peaks. Um, they would have been eroded back more into into their present positions. They might look a little bit odd, but I'm sure, pretty sure you would, we, you would recognize them. Pliocene, this, rep, this is a period where um, uh, bipedal hominids first emerged, and it's only in Pleistocene, which is the last ice age, is where modern man actually came. And in such a short time, we put this kind of impact on our... On our uh, planet. I just now, as I'm talking about an estuary, I just want to say something about lakes and estuaries in the geological time scale. And they are really very short-lived uh, features in, in, in the geological context. Uh, ge very often they are filled from the head, from the catchments area with sediment and disappear. Uh, some of them, particularly things like glacial ones or crater lakes and so on, they erode away a toe and drain. And then, of course, in the case of estuaries, here you may actually have a situation where the sea floods them and they disappear from that point of view. Uh, another characteristic of the lakes is they tend to go through a maturation process, move, moving through from oligotrophic uh, systems which are rather poor in nutrients through mesotrophic to eutrophic, which is a case where there's so much nutrient in the system that it really can be regarded as a pollutant. And that, in fact, is the state we're at with sunflay. It is recognized as a eutrophic system. In the natural environment, uh, this progression of maturation takes centuries. But with our in interference, dumping sewage, waste, fertilizer, pesticides, and all these things, that can progress within just a few decades. Now, how old are, are lakes themselves? I've said they're short-lived, but the, most long, the longest-lived ones are usually uh, Rift Valley lakes because they have a tectonic event that keeps sustaining them. Um, but most existing lakes tend to be of the order of about 10,000 years old. And the reason for that is because they are related to the topography left behind with the retreat of the last ice age. And you may be interested to know that that, in fact, is where sunflay uh, has its origins as well. <laughs> uh, 
Now I'm going to take you right up to the last little bit, just the last uh, 2 million years. So we're looking at 0.004% of geological time. And to study this, what we really do is look at what has happened to sea level during that period of time. And I'm showing this here by on this vertical axis. I've plotted time or the date from 2 million years up to the present. And on the horizontal axis here, I have plotted sea level relative to zero being present day um, on the, along that red line. And so the blue line shows through progression of time where, uh, where sea level has, has risen. And our geological record during that case is the, what's referred to as the Sunfelt Group. And these are the sediments which you'll see well displayed in, in the um, cliffs out at Swycliffe and can be followed all the way through to Longabon. Um, and David actually drew your attention two weeks ago to the West Coast Fossil Park, which are also in, these, in this group of rocks. So these are all Pleistocene age sediments of some form or other, and it's only way up at the top here, coincident with the last glacial maximum at 20,000 years. Uh, we actually then, uh, just when that starts to lift up, that is when we change to the Holo Holocene. So in the geological time, what we refer to, generally if you take your present sea level as your, your reference point, we refer to a regression as a time when the sea level drops. And that tends to be a time of erosion, where mostly at your reference point, you will be having material eroded rather than deposited. The reverse is a case when the sea level rises above the, normal, the norm. We refer to that as a transgression. And in that case, very often you will actually have shallow marine sediments deposited at your point of reference. Um, so with these variations, let's just look at these things. I've plotted here. Um, uh, a transgression that took place at 1.4 million years ago. And here you can see that the um, sea has come right through and inundated the whole of the Cape Flats. Some people refer to that as the Cape Strait. And interestingly, this started at about 1.5 million years, continued to be high, and it lasted for about five, 500,000 years that we had a situation where this remained flooded and of course also through the valley at Fishhook there was also a big gap there. So this would have been a time where Zunflay would have been underwater. So in other words it clearly didn't exist at that time. If we to look at the reverse and that is a case of a regression and here the, the map that's been drawn correlates with the last glacial maximum right over here, just before the start of the Holocene. And you can see that the uh, strand line has moved all the way out so that the whole of Fulse, Fulse Bay would have been entirely dry. <coughs> Sunflay at the stage, its closest point to the, to the shore would have been 25 kilometers away. It would be 25 k's inland. So it was a fairly different system. And you can imagine that this period being relative, ele, elevated that much more relative to the sea, um, it, it would be undergoing quite a lot of erosion. And what would have evolved, if you can imagine, would be a system like this, where there would be a very big fluvial system developed over what is now the Cape Flats and the whole of False Bay, which passes are just to the east of Sea and fairly close to Seal Island and would have come out somewhere over here. Um, the interesting thing to note too there is that the main trunk stream would have been roughly north-south and all the tributaries would have been more or less east-west structures in there, which is different to the situation we have now. So now I just want to turn you back to the actual rocks and I've, on the right here, I have a geological map of, of uh, the peninsula. 
and this little uh, red line represents uh, the position of the section I've drawn. It's very diagrammatic on the left. The other thing to point out to you are the, these intense blue spots. That one represents Sunflare, and this one uh, represents the Siku Rondeflay system, uh, just uh, to give you your, your, uh, your bearings. And as I said before, the uh, Cape Granites are the oldest rocks in the area, underlying the whole area. And these on the geological map show up at these, as, as these pink areas. And that big river system that I was talking about that would have been eroded down here actually has eroded a valley which um, at, at the, the present uh, strand level is about 40 meters below sea level. It's that deep, or it was that deep. Um, after the uh, solidification of the granite, and its erosion and uplift, we then had a position, a situation where the peninsula formation sediments were laid down on top of it. And they represent the blue material over here and the striped blue material on that side there. As we said, they were then uh, faulted and we started to erode back into the recognizable form of the peninsula, form, uh, peninsula formation. And as we as we eroded that back, so we developed some fairly big talus deposits along the slopes of the mountains. And here's an example on the right here. I have a photograph just taken of one of the road cuttings on Boys Drive. Through one of these talus deposits, you can see the big blocks of sandstone set in a matrix. But it is not loose sand. The interesting thing about this is it is already so consolidated. And we suspect that these probably have an age of perhaps even as much as 5 million years, some of them. So this didn't come down tumbling down the, mount, down, yes, down the mountain yesterday. It's been here for some time. It has been consolidated, uh, impregnated by iron-rich uh, groundwater, leaving solutions to the extent that water you can see here is pouring down the outside. It is the, because the, the rock itself uh, has that impermeability to that extent already. If we just look across, here we are at the moment in the lookout. If you look across the road here, you actually see these big boulders coming out. And again, these have not just tumbled down the mountain in the last few years. They are actually being eroded out of semi-consolidated material like this. So the conclusion from looking at these photographs is you can see that the talus actually forms the western shore to at least part of Sunflay and gives us, in a way, a maximum age. Sunflay must have been older than, than uh, that material, the deposition of that material. Uh, just turning back then to... Uh, my map, these yellow areas on, on here represent the lower part of the Sandfeld group, the Springfontein Formation, and those are found out, you can see, all along the Swartcliffe uh, cliffs and so on. They are they're well exposed, and you can find them all the way right up to, to um, Langebein. These would have been formed, uh, deposited during one of the Pleistocene transgressions where it would have the, the, the shallow marine sediments would have started to be deposited in this valley and uh, out over the Cape Flats. <clears throat> now that material um, is quite interesting. This is what it looks like. Uh, at least some of it does. This is a photograph taken from the northern shore of, of Sunflare. And we're, what we're looking at here is uh, loose, it's still loose sediment, but you can see there are many gastropods in it, and there are lots of little piece of mollusk shell in it as well. So that's definitely not dune snails. We're looking at what quite clearly is a shallow marine deposit of Pleistocene age. So in effect, you're looking at what are Pleistocene fossils in that particular photograph. Uh, 
Um, the next feature I want to talk to you about is this pale yellowy green area and that is referred to um, as the false bay dune plume and what happened is as the strand line started to move back into false bay so there would have been more and more um, uh, wave action churning up the sand and the and the winds blowing these big aeolian plumes inland and up this valley and trying and filling it and filling it up to some extent so there would have been this continued battle through this time between the fluvial uh, uh, flow trying to cut back and keep the channel clear um, and the uh, the sand continually trying to fill it and and the the main river would have main, managed to keep its course it, it's referred to as the deep or lotus river proto, proto system but what would have come and stuck is all those east west tributaries that I showed you on an earlier photograph, they would have been become choked with this Aeolian material. And one actually can see where the old little east-west structures, these are allu alluvium, bits of alluvium uh, along here, would have actually been forced to find a new route down to the sea. And so they would have come down in a more southerly direction. And in fact, they would have given rise to flays like sunflay itself. So from this, we can see these, this, this material here postdates the last glacial age, and it was a prerequisite to forming these, these flay structures here. So from that, we can anticipate that sunflay is really li only likely to be certainly less than 20,000 years old, possibly even less than 12,000 years in, in age. So that gives you all your geological background. Now I'm going to move very quickly through into the catchment area itself. And uh, we, uh, we've really done quite a lot to it. The firstly, from the agricultural point of view, we find that many of the farms have in the past certainly abstracted water from the material, and that affects the the, what, what, how much water finds its way back into the flay. Um, the clearing of riparian vegetation can increase erosion and the sediment load uh, in, the in, the, in the system. Uh, here, if we look at the impacts from an urban point of view, the canalization is really extreme. If you see the, the blue uh, rivers here represent one still in, in the natural state, but all the other, rep all the other colored lines represent some different uh, form of canalization or whatever that's been modified. And sadly, not only that, but around it too, with paving area, increases the runoff. And the impact on this really is that it does disrupt the connection between the river and the groundwater system and is going to be going to affect negatively the continued flow through the year of water. Finally, then, of course, pollution, which relates both to the industrial activities uh, inland as well as litter and so on to the solid load. Now, mostly when I talk about pollution, I think most people here tend to think about immediately about E. coli levels and so on in the flay. Um, and I'm not going to talk about that now at all tonight. What I want to do is just draw your attention to another form of pollution that goes on and uh, people are not very aware of. And that is uh, last year, uh, 28 samples distributed around the whole of Sunflay and the marina were sampled and analyzed for seven heavy metals. And I've just summarized the data here by, in this column, giving the arithmetic mean of those 28 samples. And on the right here, I have put in the maximum value found in that sample suite. Now, to give you some context for that, I've put up two guidelines. The first on the left is the what's called the maximum guideline. 
and that represents the maximum maximum level of abundance, if you like, of that particular metal in sediment without there being any negative effect to the biota. On the right, what's referred to as the probable effect relates to a figure at which it is very unlikely that you're not going to have a negative impact on the organisms in, in the vicinity of that. And when you look at that, you see immediately that lead and zinc are really quite of great concern where these values exceed both the probable effect and even the average, which is quite astonishing, exceeds the maximum guide. The other one I want to draw your attention to as well as cad cadmium, which is quite a nasty little element um, and it, it can become toxic at fairly low levels. And we can see here that's also knocking at the door. Uh, the mean is certainly above the maximum guide, but we haven't quite got to that yet. Now, the other thing is to realize is that with E. coli, they're here today, they're gone tomorrow. This day in and day out is sitting in the muds at the bottom of your flay. So that's all I plan to say about the, the, the um, catchment area. The samples we were talking about that tend to be <coughs> worst off in terms of the heavy metals would have been in the areas here of really low um, currents and, and, and of course in, in the marina itself. So those would be the areas most affected by that material. Now I want to move your attention down to the mouth and you can, as you can see from all these labels, there's quite a lot going on there to talk about. And let's just go into that. First of all, just to point out that estuaries are categorized according to their size and connection to the sea into different types of estuaries. And the one that Sunflay is classed as is referred to as a temporary open closed estuary, a TOCE. And these are, have uh, certain distinct characteristics. The first one is the fluvial one. We see that there's a great variation in the river uh, contribution into the flay, both from a seasonal perspective and we also have much longer cycles of drought. Um, the, they also tend to have relatively small catchment areas and this limits the amount of fresh water that is available. So that they all contribute to that being very um, variable throughout the year. The same thing with the tidal. The contribution from the tide varies a lot too. Firstly, we have limited tidal influence during the open periods, but for half of the year in its natural state, it would be closed and you'd have almost no tidal effect. Um, also with the high energy surf zones, these can transport uh, large amounts of sand around the mouth. And having sand around the mouth of a TOC is not, uh, not unusual at all. And we just uh, want to draw your attention to this quite uh, that typically TOCEs are open during the winter and closed during the summer. And I draw, I, I draw you, I want to just emphasize that to some degree because I have often had people come to me and say, why don't they just bulldoze the mouth open and it'll just be like the Breda River? Well, they are not in, in the same kind of class of category at all, and that's not going to be, the, never going to be the case. And we have to know that if we're bulldozing the, the mouth open during summer, we're actually doing something that is quite unnatural. And I want to just tell you a little bit more about the uh, tidal dynamics and take you back to the fact that we all know I plotted here just time along the horizontal axis, current velocity, tidal current velocity along the, the vertical axis. And we all know that we have a cycle in which the tides come in, flow faster and faster, and then diminish and go out to a low and then go back up. And, and that happens every 12 hours and 25 minutes. And it's pretty well in the open marine environment 
a totally symmetrical cycle. But when you come into an estuary, the situation changes. And that is because when you've got the flood tide coming in, you've actually got the, uh, the, tide, the fluvial flow actually opposes it. Whereas when clearly we've got ebb flow, the, the uh, fluvial flow supports it. And so we have a asymmetry that is developed. And not only is it asymmetric with the ebb being longer than the flood side, but also there's an offset from the, uh, the, the point of the highest velocity is actually later in the estuary than it would be in the adjacent marine area. And the same takes place for the, uh, the low. Now I want to introduce into that cycle the question of sediment and sediment transport. And I'd like you just to focus up on this diagram to start with. On the horizontal axis, I've plotted here particle size in the sand, and here again, velocity. And the little bluish block I've put on there are the kinds of grain sizes and velocities we can expect in the sunflow system. Are there two curves on this graph that split the area into three different areas. And the first one is uh, the curve we refer to as the fall velocity. And to determine that, all you do is you take a cylinder of water and you drop grains of a particular sediment through it and you measure how quickly it falls to the bottom. And that is your fall velocity. Now what's important is that If the tidal current has a velocity greater than that of the fall velocity, it is going to transport the material. But if it falls below that, then the material is going to collect on the floor. So that separates the first two domains. The second one I want to talk about is referred to as the threshold velocity or as the erosion velocity. And this is this rather wavy line here. And uh, it's, it, it indicates that to actually erode material, to get material up off the bottom of a basin and, uh, and train it into the flow, it takes a lot more energy. Um, in the case of very coarse material, here we can see the two curves are fairly close together, but for fine material, it's actually quite far apart, which is perhaps a little bit surprising. So it's only when we get up to this threshold that we are, we are able to erode material, take it up for, off the bottom and then train it. Now I want to take this information and take it back across to our tidal dynamics. And on this plot, again, we know that this line here represents a zero velocity. It reached, it's reached at our slack points in each term. And we know at that point, certainly there's going to be uh, little or no current velocity. Certainly, the sediment that is, is in suspension is going to drop out. And the, of course, the longer it's held in that position, more of it that will drop out. And the finer materials start to drop out as well. But as time progresses and the current starts to pick up, whether it's in or out, we will then get to a situation where we move into this area two. In other words, the velocity will exceed, the, the, the velocity of the, the currents will exceed the fall velocity and it will be able to move material in and out. And it's only when we get here to what I've shown as the threshold outside this bar where we we'll actually be in a position where we can erode material. And we see from here that the velocities are much higher in the flood cycle than they are in the edge cycle. So, what, so what's going to happen, of course, is that the flood flow is going to bring in more material and coarser material uh, and, and force it further up the mouth of the flay. And the, the ebb current does not have the energy to 
to move all of that material. So some of the material that is brought in by the flood flow is actually going to be left behind. It cannot be removed uh, except through flood cycles and things of that nature. And of course, if you build a rubble rear or something across the mouth, you're just going to aggravate that and make it more and more difficult for the material to be removed. And this is what that means. We've taken here a series of Google Earth images starting in 2002 and working through to 2009. You can see here's the Royal Road Bridge. Here's Thiessen's Bridge. You can actually see it with the first thing, the, the sheet of sand that has come, been forced in and unable to get out is progressing here in 2005. It's gone all the way up and so on and so on. And I've taken all of them and, and worked out an average that in the last 13 years, that front has been moving at about 2.5 meters per month for the last 13 years up the show. And if you take that and take all the points that you can, all the images you can, and get a regression line to fit on it, that gives you your average. Uh, but every now and again, you'll see that it advances faster. In other words, this goes up more, uh, more rapidly than the other. Uh, in terms of the, the, the advance of the bar. And this always happens in summer. So from this, we can actually see the sediment advance when you calculate in summer months, which is the unnatural situation to have that mouth open, is advancing at about 3.6 3 meters per month, whereas the average over the whole period is 2.2. So what's happening in the mouth, which is only open for a short period um, artificially, we're finding we're getting 60% more advance in that very short period than we are um, during the, the, the rest of the year. And secondly, we're getting a continued accumulation of sand and the advance of that sand, sand sheet is direct consequence of two things we're doing. The one is that we're putting in the weir which effectively dams it up, gives you nice, quiet conditions above it, and the ebb flow doesn't have the energy to remove it over it. And the second thing we're doing is, that the, is in the summer months when we've got the southeaster really churning things up, lots of strong wave action in training, lots of sediment, we open it, and uh, in that unnatural, unnatural situation, it's finding its way further and further up into the system. So what affects sedimentation? Firstly, of course, we, as you can see, it is the current, current uh, velocity itself. And we see that that's affected by the tidal and seasons, the, the tides and the seasons. That the depth of water is an also, also an, a very important thing from two points of view. The one is naturally the mouth remains um, uh, blocked until such time as the water level gets enough of a head on it to actually break, break, break through and that entire surge of all that potential energy can move out all the sediment that has been accumulated. But also the other thing is with the with the increased depth of water, you also impede the injection of the saline wedge from the sea. Conversely, sediments accumulated above the weave results in shallow water, and that impedes velocity from, uh, from, the, uh, from, that, yeah, from the point of view of bread friction. And any kayaker will tell you that as soon as he goes over a shallow sandbar, he can feel the difference, the drag. Wind is also a very important thing. And if we just draw it in this little cartoon, in the winter situation here, we have sand being brought in by the sea as always, but we have a much bigger flow of fresh water into it. And we also have it supported mostly by our northerly winds. Whereas in the summer, which would normally be closed, here we've got our southeast winds, and 
the introduction of sediment and so on there is hardly impeded at all by the fresh water coming down into the system. And then, of course, added to all of that, we have human impacts, catchment modifications, the weir itself, the opening of the, the mouth during the summer, and now also another thing that has come up, particularly because we don't want any flooding, uh, we've restricted the water range so we don't get that scouring. Is it such a big deal? So what if there's a little bit of sand near the bath? Well, these are the problems. Firstly, it impedes the penetration of saline prism because you've filled up the channel. Secondly, it impedes the outflow of what can often be polluted water for the same reason. And this increases the risk of flooding in the system. And lastly, then, people have shown uh, through, um, through uh, solid research that the mouth, the, the, the channel at the mouth impacts on fish mig migration. If you have, you, you have um, a good deep channel, then you have both an increase in numbers and you also increase the number of species coming in and out of the flare. So for all of these reasons, we'd rather not see an unnatural development of a sand sheet up, up at the mouth. And this is not news. <laughs> We've known it for a long time. Ninam Shan, back in 2000, produced a, a report specifically on sunflay, and these were their conclusions. The most important factors influencing the sediment dynamics at the mouth are the level of the rubble where the maximum water levels at breaching, the strength of tidal exchange, and the river flow into the estuary. The restrictions placed on the minimum and maximum water levels are the root cause of most of the problems in the estuary. And their recommendation was that the level of the weir be lowered and that higher water levels be allowed before breaching takes place. And to complement that, if you like, was another piece of research on uh, TOC um, estuaries as a group. And this, this did not relate to sunflay itself, but their conclusion was continuous low-level artificial opening of the mouth will almost guarantee a slow shallowing of the estuary as a result of sediment accumulation, particularly in the lower reaches of the system. To take you to the next level of uh, part of my talk, I just want to, uh, I have to create a little model to talk about water residence time. And this little box here represents the flay. We're filled with a pale green water. We introduce river water in, which is shown here as a brown, a brown material. And we also, from the sea, introduce a saline wedge when the mouth is open. And clearly, if you're putting saline water in and, flu and uh, river water in, you have to discharge a mix of estuarine water are back out into the sea. And this, is, uh, this uh, hydrodynamic system um, is quite important to understand what they refer to as the residence time. Here we have it's really the average time for a particle to escape the estuary, or if you want to think of it another way, the average time a particle will reside in the estuary before it goes out. And this is a really important uh, feature in terms of managing a flay. Now, but modeling of a residence time is quite difficult. For the purposes of my talk, I want to just say, let's just ignore this, and I can illustrate my points just by considering flushing time, which is a much simpler case, which applies to lakes rather than estuaries. And here we can see it's the time for the fluvial input to replace the estuarine volume. Or if you were like, you think of it another way, it would be if you have an empty, an empty estuary, how long would it take for the river to fill it up? That's what we're going to look at there. And this is important because here we have a turn, the turnover in water is important because the water residence time is an important descriptor of estuarine circulation and a measure of eutrophication vulnerability. And the increase of flushing, flushing capacity is a man, management measure that can mitigate eutrophication or pollution of the system. 
So how do we improve it then? Can we improve the flashing time at all? We can if we increase uh, the amount of rainfall and run, runoff coming into the system. If we decrease abstraction and if we're fortunate, fortunate enough to fall outside of periods of drought. We could, of course, reduce the volume, but this is normally something we would just regard as a constant, uh, although we have changed it at, during the history of sunflay. The rate of outflow, if you can increase the depth or the area of the outflow channel, or of course increase the time the mouth is open, but that has, that has the uh, unwanted consequence of a buildup of sand. And then of course tidal input to increase the mouth width and the channel depth, or of course time it to be at the high tight of the tide. So all of those will improve the flushing time. Now I want to take you briefly through the history of sunflay and what we've done to modify the basin. And I've got this set up as a bit of a comic. <laughs> and in the top line, I've drawn a little box representing a cross section, if you like, through the, through the uh, estuary. And on the lower level, I have a plan view of that estuary as well and how it's changed with time. And my benchmark it takes us back to the 1700s where we know that it had a very wide mouth. And the other interesting thing too is that the range before it would naturally break through used to go up to between two and a half and three meters above mean sea level before it would have the, enough energy to break through and really flush it all out scar it out and I was quite astonished to find it that at one time where they recorded a three meter level to uh, before breaking that that boom it actually eroded a channel down to minus four meters below mean sea level which really astounds me but that just does show you the efficiency of that system once it gets going so during this time clearly we also had quite a significant tidal influence with that nice broad, broad mass. When we move into the 1800s, we started to change things. We closed the mass for agricultural purposes to try and help us. And in 1882, the railway line came across and reached Musenberg. And to get it across through to Musenberg, they actually built an embankment 700 meters in length and quite clearly that uh, that in itself severed what's now West Lake Pond, the remnants of, remnants of it, uh, from the rest of the main flay. So quite clearly uh, what, what happened there, surprisingly if you like, is we actually reduced the saline, dig, saline wedge but in fact here we were actually improving the flushing time with time as we reduced the volume in that particular case. When we go to the 1940s, again, the outlet was canalized. There was dredging. They built a causeway across it, and the weir was built. And all of these tend, tended to restrict the mouth, increase the volume. Now I've shown that here just by indicating the dredging is adding a sump onto the, onto the, onto the section. And quite clearly, the water res residence time was going up. Uh, we moved from the 50s into the 70s, means we're actually crossing from the Holocene into Anthropocene, and this is where we really get going, if you like. Um, and uh, with the building of the marina and the dredging accompanying it, we really restricted the mouth, we increased the volume quite dramatically. Here, not only have we dredged it, but here I've shown we've extended it with all the canals into the into the marina, uh, increasing the volume quite a, quite a lot. And that would, of course, lengthen the water residence time. The other thing that we did as a result of buildings and revetment and so on in there is we, we restricted the level we allow the flay to move between 0.7 and 1.4 meters above mean sea level. So we've really made quite a change there. And then when we go into the 80s, we, we continued with our dredging program. The weir was raised higher. 
and water. There was an interesting experiment. They actually pumped water into the flay rather than opening the mouth. I don't know what the upshot of that was, but it was certainly an interesting idea. And again, we've restricted the mouth further. We've got a longer sand sheet in the mouth, clogging it up. I'm showing that by this little yellow bar here. And uh, we've left the rill. So certainly, with all of those combined together, we've increased water residence time yet again. And finally, in the 2010s, ultimately, uh, we started to take cognizance of the advice that was being put, and we have started at least to reduce the height of the weir, um, but we've still got, uh, with reduction of that weir, we actually increased the depth of penetration of the sand sheet, and I'll try to show that in this case here. So here we certainly have uh, quite a long history of uh, modifying the shape of the flay. I just want to focus on one little thing going from this step to there is the construction of the marina and what happened. So if we go from 1940 to 1975, the volume of the flay effectively changed from that figure to that figure. It changed by 44%. Now the fluvial flow has varied over the periods from, from a minimum, which I'm showing here, and a maximum here. And of course, that has not changed with the building of the flay. But we have changed by 44% the flushing time of the flay by, main, by doing that construction. And if we take that annual average, there's yet another further bit of bad news, if you like, and that is sun flare is very seasonal. And if, we, if I've taken the, the rainfall here and, and separated it into a dry season and a wet season, and if we do that, then we actually measure the flushing time in the worst case, with minimum flow, can be as long as 80 days. Whereas in the winter, at the maximum, in other words, the best it can be, we're looking at something close to a flushing time of 13 days. So just summarizing it, I've effectively really said it, we're looking at a much longer flushing time. We, the, sing, the seasonal issue is an important one. And what this actually interprets to the bottom line, if you come to it, is what we've done to the flay just with that one event has increased its vulnerability to eutrophication or pollution by 44%. And that's without taking all the other issues like fluvial abstraction, mouth obstruction, etc., etc., uh, into consideration. Fortunately, what I presented to you here has not had, uh, does not show the ameliorating effect of the tides on the flushing time. So that's all I want to tell you about the mouth for the moment. And I want to now start focusing on the basin itself. And uh, I'm going to do that round in the vicinity of the Sand River Delta because it, it, it really isn't a great place. Uh, we're doing a lot of hard work uh, in, that, in, in that area. We can see upstream there's been a lot of work done. Uh, very successful too in reducing the litter contribution. And if we come down to this point, there's a series of nets catching the litter. And I took this photograph, I think it was two days after we'd had a little rainstorm. Uh, the nets had been clear before that, so all of this came through during that rain. The water was completely brown and turbid during that storm. But two, year, two days later, the water is clear, you can actually see through to the bottom, and interestingly too, if you look down there, you can see a lot of the canal is exposed. So there's not an awful lot of sand build up in there, which is quite interesting, because the delta is perceived as a site of sediment de deposition. And I started to think about this, and uh, uh, went to try and look, about it, look at it, um, see whether there was any other further uh, things in play. And so if we take look at this photograph taken from here, looking back up 
the sand river itself, standing on the sandbars itself. You can see all sorts of things, many, many um, vehicle tires. That's the most dominant thing. But we also have shopping baskets, shopping trolleys. We have beds, we have TVs, we have fridges, all sorts of coming down, let alone bits of plastic and bottle and so on. So that really is sad. <laughs> but one of the interesting things is looking back up at this image, we actually see what looks like a fairly deep, healthy um, channel. It doesn't look to be very clogged. Uh, with it and you need to take my word because I haven't got time to tell you about to show that to you tonight but this is not a typical shape of a delta that is fluvially dominated fluvially, fluvially dominated um, so to look a, a, along a bit I actually went along the coast to this point here found this situation here where we've got a couple of dead trees actually on the beach, as it were. Now, clearly, those, those trees did not choose to grow in saline water. They were growing very happily on the bank. And what has happened is we've actually had a transgression of the shoreline has moved in under those trees and they ended up in killing them. How could that have happened? I've just uh, looked at that here. What normally happened in the natural, when, uh, when I take go back to my youth, and used to ride a bike along a sandy shore all around the edge. What happened in the natural situation is we had a closed mouth, we had low fluvial inflow, and we had evaporation. And all these resulted in an exposed beach. And despite the fact that we had a nice strong southeaster putting in heavy wave action, that energy was dissipated harmlessly on these exposed beaches. What we've chosen to do now is in our situation, we've actually decided for the benefit of residents and uh, recreation to maintain the level un at an, an unnaturally high level. And what this results in is that the waves now no longer have a, a, an exposed beach in which to uh, dissipate their energy. Instead, they're crashing right into the edge of a shore and are eroding it away. And that's what, why that happened to those trees. Now, is that just one off or other? Um, well, here's a photo. This is where the trees I just showed you. And if you step back a bit and you look out away from this coast, you can see at least four rooted trees right out in the bay. And if you actually go to the trouble of measuring the distance, you find that you're nearly 30 meters away from the shore in that particular situation. So this has actually been going on for quite some time and has progressed quite some distance. If we go back to the delta itself, um, we actually see a similar situation. We see uh, rooted trees again here. There were more. Many of them have fallen over. And so this sandbar here cannot represent a deltaic deposit. It tended, was higher at some stage. The, the trees grew on it, and now it has been eroded down. The erosion is also impacted. If you look here at this reed bed, all the phragmites are being pushed back and broken off at those points there. So a similar feature is going in, in that area. And here again, if you look at it, we, you measure the distance from the tree furthest out back to the shore at the moment. We're looking at about 46 meters. This was where those other trees were taken for that distance there, 27.7 meters. So it's something that is not just happening on a small scale. It's certainly happening all along this shore and certainly all along the shore and I think it's I've, I've been very conservative in the way where I put those lines in fact this whole shelf here which is covered in rock almost certainly has also been subjected to the same um, process uh, I could at least put that line out here and I could probably put one much further out here without stretching it so all of that is due to 
erosion of the banks and really not due to deltaic sedimentation. What is left is in this little yellow uh, outline here represents your potential deltaic deposit, which is less than the volume of the material of the stuff that's coming from erosion. So well, what's the impact of this erosion? Is it serious? The shallow margins uh, uh, are going to result in raised water temperatures, and that, of course, could uh, lead to eutrophication. And, of course, it's no recreational inconvenience, particularly if you've got a center board. Um, the, uh, the also, we're increasing, in, by increasing the area, we're going to be increasing the evaporation rate. And I don't know whether that's a good or bad thing. It's just a fact. The other thing, of course, is the migrating shoreline is going to bring you damage to infrastructure. And here, just along the edge, at, a, at, a, at this point here, we, we have a bench rather whimsically put on the edge of the shore there. But in some other areas, it, it, can, it can become more serious. This is on Park Island. We actually see it as eroded back behind sandbags and is now threatening a beach there and ultimately further along a, a wooden walkway is also being uh, Im impacted. Down near the caravan park we can see there was an old tarred road which is no longer used, can't be used, uh, because again erosion has taken place along there. So erosion does have an impact. There's another, there's another aspect to this as well, and that is that the, the um, this is a fa something that uh, David Bristow pointed out to me, was that we're actually getting litter eroded. Now, if you look in this photograph, this material is all litter that has just been dumped on the shore. But if when you look at this edge that is being eroded away, you can actually see plastic bags, plastic sheeting, all behind the root structure and embedded into the system. So what we're looking at here is on Wildwood, Wildwood Island, a situation where it must have been used as some sort of um, wasteful site at some stage, and we are now presently eroding it and aggravating litter situation along with the damage to the, the shoreline and potential infrastructure. Just in case you think um, that's maybe a one-off, if you go and you look at the molehills all the way over Wildwood Island, you actually find there's all sorts of bits of crockery, there's bits of plastic that the moles are bringing out from underneath. So, I even found a, an, uh, an eyedropper in one of the molehills. So I hope you've con I've given you a different perspective of, of the Sand River Delta. Just to try and bring it together now, what are all the things we've been looking at that the flay is having to cope with in the Anthropocene? In the first case, if we look at what came down the catchment, we have certainly water abstraction and sediment eroded, litter, sewage, industrial pollutants, and I drew your attention there to the heavy metals that are accumulating, first, and then um, pesticides, pesticides and so on. And this certainly is all adding to the the potential of eutrophication in the flay. If we look at what we've done to it in the terms of the major events, um, here in 1882, as I said, the railway line came through and we built a 700 meter long em um, embankment through that area. Now that may not sound much like uh, much to you, but 700 meters is effectively a third of the length of the entire flay that they backed off and shut there. In retrospect, it was quite serendipitous that they did so, because in doing so, this started to uh, close up with, uh, with sediment and reeds and so on, and reduce the volume, and therefore improve the flashing time, which is a good thing before we got stuck into the marina. If we go down to the mouth, we, we find there's a lot of constri constricting infrastructure. We've, we have the caissons in the mouth there. We have the Royal Road Bridge. 
Um, and of course, we have shown here in yellow this entire area filled up with sand now because of our opening of the mouth in the summertime, in the, in the, during the summer season. So here we have a, a marine sediment trap above the, the weir. We have an impediment to the tidal wedge. We're increasing the risk of flooding up to, and again, we no longer have that nice deep channel and that is going to impede fish migration and uh, biodiversity in that sense. Having put those things in there, of course, we have to manage it, and that's, this is no easy task, um, because every, every decision is, is certainly a compromise in some shape or form. But if we just look through them, what we've had to do is we've mentioned that the high summer water level means that we're getting bank and waste erosion, and we're getting an impediment to the tidal wedge, because if you've got a high uh, level in the water, it, it stops the wedge from coming in that much more. Uh, in the marina itself, we've got water level constraints. Uh, that means they don't want it too low, and we don't want it too high. And that means that if we diminish the scouring, we can't remove the sediment naturally, and the saline uh, ingress. And of course, we've also had several spills from um, sewage stations in that area, also indicating the potential of, of uh, eutrophication. The other one I should just touch on is in terms of the wo reduced water level range and the increased flashing time. In the flay itself, in the, in the marina itself, the way it was constructed, we're increasing the chance of eugenic conditions developing. Um, yeah, I think we've gone through that. Another one just to touch on, which I haven't in the main body of the course, is we've got a high intensity leisure zone in this area and the wind transfers all sorts of things uh, up to the top end of the flay, which in fact is a conservation area. And I've actually over the years, I've collected over a dozen soccer balls up here, <laughs> apart from many other things like bottles and balloons and all sorts of things, hats and so on. Um, and then just to finish off, the last really thing is looking into the future. What, what are we, where are we going now? Next thing, there's talk right now of dredging. And of course, if we dredge, we're going to increase the volume, we're going to increase the flushing time, and we're running those risks of bringing on um, eutrophication again, again, once again. So that I should just explain a little bit. I'm all for dredging in this area here. I believe that's essential to try and keep some sort of connection to the sea. I'm a little bit more worried about uh, dredging in this area. I understand its need from a point of view, from the, particularly from the recreation uh, point of view. Um, but if that dredging is a little bit over exuberant, all we're going to do is increase the flushing time. Quite clearly with, with climate change, we've already seen it early this year. We started to see rainstorms and up in the catchment area we're seeing flooding and we can anticipate that that's going to happen somewhere down here. And we can also find with all the energy going into um, sea level rise along with it, we can anticipate storm surge activity itself. So I think all in all that gives you an overview of what Sunflay is coping with so far in the Anthropocene. And none of these things were brought along with people with malintent. Uh, we know what the problems are. It's really a case of the benefit of this hindsight. What are we going to do now? Thank you so much for your attention.